Hello? This is you. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. Well, what year is it? Is it early model or a late model? Well, it sounds like the adjuster cable is just a bit too long, and there's ways you could sort that out for yourself. Well, you could turn the adjuster, yeah. Well, you could also put a spacer in where the cable meets the throttle. Some guys will uh, take a dime and cut a slit in it, put that in there. Yeah, a dime. That'll cost you about 10 cents. Well, you'd have to bring it in. We're a cash shop. No, I don't have anything on the shelf, but I could order something for you pretty inexpensively. Catalog. No, I don't have any catalogs. Well, we do repairs. Or you might call up uh, John Cycle. They could probably sort you out, order something up for you. Over Long Island City. Yeah. Right, good luck, man. Cheers. Bobby? Bobby? Have you got any catalogs down there? Well, I don't know. Uh, Victoria's Secret? All right, what, what you working on? On the Trident? Look at Bobby go. All right. Guy asked me the other day, uh, do I want to be on the internet? Expand the business, increase my sales, put my inventory online? Well, the thing about that is, if I want to list my inventory, I've got to sort it all out. Know what I have. You've got to know what you have to uh, tell people what you have. And then spending two or three hours a day responding to emails. <laughs> Life's too short. Well, it's not what we do, you know. Somebody knows what he wants. He can order it as cheap online, as cheaply as I can get it for him. And if he doesn't know what he wants, he's got to bring it in. If we had an internet page, it would say one thing. We don't have an inventory. We don't take orders electronically, and we don't respond to emails. Sticking with what you do is the secret of a business like this. We've always been quite small. Never tried to get too big. We're the only ones left. All the others have gone the way of the dinosaurs. Remember that Harley craze a couple of years back? The great American cycle down on Holland, by the Holland Tunnel. They built up this overhead over a couple of years, and then they just folded. It collapsed under its own weight. Couldn't sustain it. We never tried to offer more than we could, and we're still here. Of course, the city doesn't make it any easier for you once they get wind of what you're doing. Once they start sussing you out, it's all about the dough, you know. But we were always uh, undercover. This started out back, well, when I first moved to New York, I was riding a Yamaha around, 1965 Yamaha. No pipes on it, waking the neighbors up 6 a.m., you know. <laughs> and this guy, Steve Lintner. You know Steve Lintner? He wrote that book on diners, the photographs, the historical background and all that. Steve had come up from Philly, and one day I saw him pulling this Triumph out of his garage. So he let me take a ride on it. Well, there's no going back. I asked him if he has another one, and he doesn't. But a few days later, he calls me up, tells me there's a buddy down in Philly has got one. He's selling it. So I go down there. It's a BSA. Don't know a BSA from the Triumph. I ride it back, you know, on the turnpike. I blew up three motors on that bike. You could just get a motor right out there on the sidewalk on Avenue A, but I realized if I was going to learn to ride it, I was going to have to learn to fix it. So one night, I parked at the Odessa next to a Triumph. I left my card on the bike. And when I come out from dinner, there's a guy leaving a note on the card. That was Dmitry Tudor. Dmitry come from a Russian family that moved around a great deal for various reasons. He'd just come down from Boston to cop some dough. 
Well, he just had his dope. There's no condition to ride. So I said, well, let's come back to my place. And we got on pretty good. He stayed with me for six months. We were a very good team. We're doing construction together. We go up on our bikes, Upper West Side, West End Avenue. Guy gave us a $55,000 check. There's us with our leather jackets, bikes on the sidewalk. I thought that was very interesting. <laughs> and we started fixing motorcycles. He had a very good intuition, very good at diagnosing a problem. And I was good with the wrenches, you know, a good wrench spinner. There grew up to be around us this sort of classic British motorcycle scene. But it was always undercover. Every now and then, an inspector would come by, take a look around, never give us any trouble. Then one day, there was a fire down at Billy's nightclub down the block. They thought it was an arson. So one of the White Hots comes by, sees us taking the bikes out of the basement, makes us take everything out, all the bikes, all the tools, all the parts out on the sidewalk, two days before Thanksgiving. Well, Pat, my wife, she's an architect. She went down to the Department of Buildings, had a little look around. Turns out we're zoned for it. This used to be an industrial laundry. And it's the same thing, washing your clothes, motor vehicle repair. So she gets me my uh, letter of no objection, which is essentially a certificate of occupancy, a C of O. I bring that back, put everything back in the basement. The guy comes by a couple of days later. What the hell's going on around here? I pointed that there was not a damn thing he could do about it. <laughs> So that worked out for several years. And then the next thing, I get a $1,000 fine for operating a business without a license. So I go down to the judge. I say, look, here's my paperwork. Here's my seat of O. He says, it doesn't matter. You got to have a permit, and that's that. Got to send a packet of applications up to Albany. Go up there for an interview. Well, he waves the fine, so we got rid of that. So I'm bobbing and weaving, and that's not happening. Then a couple days after Christmas, a couple guys come in with their little notebooks and pencils from the Bureau of Auto Crimes or whatever. I say, look, there's two bikes up here. There's 20 down in the basement, but there's only two up here. I say, it's more of a hobby. And they say, it doesn't matter. You're taking money for it, and that's all there is to it. And then his partner looks over and says, is that a Triumph? Turns out his brother's got one, and he's been doing some work on it. So next thing I know, they're writing a little number down in the notebook, and that's how I got my license. That's when I painted my green sign. But I never would have done that unless they pushed me to it. Never had an employee. Every now and then a guy would come by, do some work for us, get the hang of it. Bobby. We built a bike for Bobby, and he dropped the cap of a pen down the cylinder hole. Too embarrassed to ask us to sort it out for him. So he gives us a call and asks if we can uh, talk him through it. So we do. He gets the hang of it, and now here he is. Another non-employee of Sixth Street Specials. Never would have done it any other way. Well, this is all Giuliani, you know. Quality of life company. It's just a desk sergeant sending guys out. and One week it's motorcycles. Next week it's car stereos. So they're after all the radio players. But for us, it's what's the difference? Now I pay $150 every two years for my license. Back in the 80s, used to get hit up by some junkie. Now I'm getting hit up by the state. Now, little bitches up on 8th Street with their poodles, they don't want to walk them up there. They don't want to have to clean it up, so they bring them down here. But for me, whether it's a poodle crapping on the step or some junkie just had his dope, don't know if you're familiar with that. Right after you had your dope, first thing. But whether it's a poodle crapping on the steps or a junkie, I'm still cleaning it up. Poodles and junkies. I remember back in the 80s, all the clubs then, 8BC on 8th Street between B and C, Lembo Lounge on 10th and D. Remember Save the Robots? I did all the construction on Save the Robots. That was the most famous after-hours club in the city. After-after-hours club. There was this guy, Rick Gallagher. He had a little shop over on Avenue B, house party. So we cleared out the back put a little 50s bar in, it was a furniture store, put in a stereo, 
And at four o'clock in the morning, after all the clubs had closed, go there, sneak in through the furniture, into the back, have ourselves a little hangout. Well, Rick went partners with Denis Pruvel, a French guy. Rick took the shop over to Avenue A, took house party with him. And Demi changed the name to uh, Dream, Dream something or other. Oh, that was very short-lived. And then it became See the Robots. That was great. You go there, you rap on this like gate. The gate would roll up, sneak in past the furniture, have yourself a high old time. You'd be dancing your life away then. This was, uh, well, we were all living in the same place then. Uh, Dominic Blandau did all the decorations, uh, all the wild paintings and sculptures, all that. I did all the construction on it. Don't know if you ever went there, Save the Robots. Everyone went there back in the 80s. It was the After After Hours Club in New York. Had many a fun time there. Closed that place down on more than one occasion. <laughs> but I must say, most everyone I was hanging out with then, they're all dead. Sure, didn't know when to stop. Didn't quit. Thing is, when you're in your 20s, you can dance all night, days on end. But later on, your body just can't take it. So I quit cigarettes, hard drugs, stop drinking coffee, only drink tea. It's better for the back. Not to be, I'd be lifting Keith up out of the tub and feel it back here. Stop drinking coffee, that sort of that out. Touch wood, lucky to still be here. But a lot of them couldn't stop, which is sad, you know. Demi Tudor started all out with me. He OD'd uh, St. Patrick's Day, 10 years ago. That's him up there. Well, a lot of them probably wouldn't like the neighborhood anyway. Fuck off to Bushwick or somewhere, find a little hole to crawl into. Used to be you go in, into the inner city. Now they just go out, further out. Williamsburg, Williamsburg just skipped it. Went full circle to the chic and trendy uh, Chic and trendy. Funniest thing I had a few years back, everyone coming up and saying, oh, East Village, that's the new Williamsburg. <laughs> Remember Tompkins Square Park? That was a tent city. Hundreds of people lived there, hundreds of people. It got so the only way they could deal with it was just to clear it out. They just closed it. Brought in a bulldozer, swept everyone out of the park. And it's all new now. Rebuilt it. All the fences there, all the walls, the fences are sitting on their own now. This was back in the early 90s. I just moved up to 8th Street between B and C. And there was an empty lot across the street from the park. And they all moved into there. Which was kind of a drag, you know, because Keith was a little baby then. The park is where you want to be taking it. So it was a double-edged sword. But into that lot went the entire Mexican transient workforce. All the junkies come in from the Midwest, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, wherever that lot's coming from, all into the parks. Man, the shit I saw happening there. I saw a dog get machete to death right in front of my window, me watching. Amazing scenes. They hooked up a shower head to a fire hydrant right in front of the building. All day long, a continuous line of people showering right in front of the house. Amazing. One night, the whole back half of it caught up on fire. Don't know how it caught on fire, but those little crappy cardboard houses they were building went up on fire. Next day, the police came through with an army. They had to call the fire department to put it out, which really uh, drew attention to it. Police came through, put up a big old fence. And that was really when those sort of people started getting pushed out of the neighborhood. So it wasn't until uh, two years after they closed the park that they started renovating, because they had all moved in there, condensed, you know. It must amaze people who've been here for any length of time. You've been here 20 years, doing this, doing that, squatting, whatever. 
guy next door to you is moving into a brand new building, paying a million dollars for an apartment. You can't get your plumbing fixed. That's, that's weird. Must be in a shock, state of shock about it. Still, this has always been an immigrant neighborhood. Shit, coming and going. Always be that way. I thought it was very interesting, that movie, The uh, Gangs of New York. Sean coming in from Ireland or wherever, going straight down. They come from Ireland, uh, get put in a uniform, sent down to Virginia, fighting the Civil War, come back dead in a box, drop right on the dock. That's a life. I'm from Scotland, but I really feel like a New Yorker. I think it gets to be, when you've been here five years, you can really claim to be a New Yorker, I would say. I come from a little town called Girvan outside of Glasgow. When I finished art school, there was no work to be found. So I went down to Paris, do construction there. That's where I met my first wife, Lisa. We came to America, and I was doing construction here. And back then, we never used to drive anywhere. Never took the car on account of the traffic. Always took the bike. That was great. I had a Cadillac ambulance, big black 65 caddy with the back all gutted out. Throw all the tools and stuff in there, drive up to the work site, drop it all off, drive back, then take the bike every day to work. And that work thing, because you could park anywhere. Park on the sidewalk, park on the street. No one was giving tickets. Now, park on the sidewalk, you get a $115, $115 ticket, park on the sidewalk. So you used to worry about them taking, someone stealing your bike, you know. Now you worry about them taking it legally, legalized theft. And that's what I'm saying. Who's your enemy? Is it the state you're in? Or, so never take the bike anymore. Just ride the bicycle. It's fucking terrible. About the only place I ride anymore is up on the dirt track at New Paltz. That's good fun. Well, that's what it's for, having fun. I mean, you, you can't just be going around. There's definitely guys just going around. They get it sorted out very, very quickly. You've always got to be trying to just get past the guy in front of you. Whether he's got a $9,000 purpose-built race bike, you've got a $900 bike, you've got to be going for it, trying to get past him. That's the only way you'll get any better. That's just how it works. And whether he's got a $9,000 bike, you've got a $900 bike, still having the same fun. That's what it's about. But fixing motorcycles is not an exact science. It's just not. You think you could clean up all the parts, put them back together so they fit nicely, and they start right up. But it just doesn't. It's a bit of a mystery. I'm quite serious about that. Still, I'll be doing this till the day I drop. Well, it's 30% mechanics, 70% psychiatry anyway. People will tell you the story their whole life, unprovoked. Last Friday, guy comes in. He's a design photographer's assistant or whatever. He's got this model on the back of the bike. You know, perfect hair, clear skin, sandals, chiffon dress. So I say to her, you want to get yourself a pair of blue jeans, a pair of leather pants, maybe some boots? Because if you get burned or fall off, you're going to be hating him for the rest of your life. And before she can say a word, he jumps in. Says, well, you know, I just took her home last night and wanted to bring her by and bring the bike in. And she's bright red. Because for all I know, it's the first time, probably the last. I'll tell you anything. It's like being a bartender. But there's no retiring from it. Something like this. I could get squeezed out. That could happen very easily. They're, they're doing construction on the building next door. If they put a crack in this building, it's all over. It's just how fragile it all is. It's a good building. It's 25 feet by 100 feet. Basement down there. Apartment in the back. But it'd be a lot cheaper to raise it if it had come to any damage than it would to rebuild it. Anyone else should... Get more for the footprint. Build something new. And they can do that here. It's zoned that way. Upper west side, upper east side, there's restrictions. You know, minimum number of square footage, minimum number of windows. But down here, you can make a little shoebox studio. Ask the same money for it as you can uptown, and that's permitted. 
crappy little, shitty little buildings, not meant to last any length of time, no finishings in them. And that's allowed, it really is. There's guidelines, outlines. You can't build over a certain number of stories like that, but cinder block buildings, that's the way to go, that's the wave of the future. What are we gonna do about that? Could never get another C of O anyway. Not giving them out anymore. I don't know if you noticed that. No gas stations, auto repair in the middle of the island. They both moved out to the edges, out to the boroughs. Unless you're grandfathered, you can't get one. That's quality of life for you. So if those fuckers start pile driving, put a crack in this building, it's all done. A very tenuous situation. Back in 2000, uh, that guy Steve Littner wrote the book about the diners. He gave me a call, says he's moving to Florida. Do I want to buy that Triumph from him? So there it is. Little bike that started all off 20 years ago. It's a handsome little motorcycle, if I do say so myself. 